In 2016, the Penske organisation celebrates an amazing 50 years in racing. And at the highest level in Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, sports car and now supercar, this team has set benchmark standards all around the world. And today we've got something very special for you. A feature documentary that will take us through the entire history of Team Penske in racing. Fifty years. It takes commitment, desire, and passion to do something, anything, for that length of time. Yet, within that amount of time, there are generally small periods that had massive effect, building blocks to something great, something historic. I love cars. I used to take them apart at home. Uh, most kids uh, were doing something else on Saturdays. I had the engines apart in the wash tub. Sensing his son's love of racing, Julius Penske took his son to the 1951 Indianapolis 500. My father had a couple extra tickets uh, to go to the Indianapolis 500. I remember I was able to sit in and put the helmet on and, and I felt like I was uh, probably uh, gonna drive in the race that weekend. In 1958, having moved to Philadelphia, Roger began his career as a race car driver. In 1961, he was named the Sports Car Club of America Driver of the Year by Sports Illustrated. Roger earned an opportunity to take the Indy 500 rookie test with legendary car owner Clint Browner. Then came one of the most difficult and historic decisions in motorsports history. You see, Roger had a new burgeoning Chevrolet dealership in Philadelphia. He believed the most responsible decision would be to concentrate on his new business venture. So on that date, May 11, 1965, Roger Penske effectively retired from driving. In his place, Browner tested a young Italian racer from Nazareth, Pennsylvania. His name, Mario Andretti. Roger turned his competitive focus to team ownership, and one year later, Team Penske was born. Success came quickly for Roger's newly formed team. In fact, the organization won its first race, a GT class win in the 1966 24 Hours of Daytona with drivers Dick Goldstrand, George Winterstein, and Ben Moore driving a Corvette Stingray. The team followed that up with a victory in another significant American endurance race, the 12 Hours of Sebring. It's hard to imagine a more impressive start. Well, this season has been uh, really one that I guess our whole team won't forget. Team Penske had been competing in the Indianapolis 500 for three years when the team rolled into Gasoline Alley for the 1972 500 mile event. Mark Donahue had already won 49 races in various series for the team. However, a win in the 500, the race that Roger holds higher than any other, had thus far eluded them. Donahue took over the lead on lap 187 and led the final 13 laps for the historic victory. Donahue also produced the team's first NASCAR win at Riverside International Raceway in Riverside, California in 1973. In Donahue, Roger Penske had found the cornerstone on which to build his motorsports castle. We feel that our car is about the best prepared one here and uh, we're gonna run it to finish and uh, hope that we're way up there at the end. As the decade of the 70s came to a close, Team Penske had become one of the premier race teams in the world. We get paid to win. If we don't win, we won't be around, so that's kind of our motivation. Enter a talented former off-road racer from Bakersfield, California, who just needed to find the right team at the right time to unleash his potential. On May 28, 1979, Rick Mears earned the first of his record-tying four wins in the Indianapolis 500. That year, he also won his first of three IndyCar titles. 
That season propelled Team Penske into the 80s when the team scored six more Indianapolis 500 titles with names like Unser and Sullivan, along with Mears. Over the course of that decade, Mears became a star and a true American icon. But more important, it was the way he carried himself throughout his spectacular career. No driver has personified the Penske way more than Mears. In 1991, fresh off his series championships two years earlier, Rusty Wallace became the second driver to compete full-time at the highest level of NASCAR for Roger Penske. I called up Roger and said, hey, do I have enough experience now to hook back up with you? And his answer was, hell yes, let's get going. During the course of the 1993 and 1994 seasons, the pairing of Wallace and crew chief Buddy Parrott would prove to be spectacular. A total of 18 wins and 36 top five finishes over those two seasons firmly planted the Team Penske flag into the NASCAR landscape for good. When he retired from racing in 2005, Wallace had amassed 37 NASCAR Cup Series wins with Team Penske. His success throughout the 90s cemented the team's place among the upper echelon of NASCAR organizations, a perch it continues to occupy to this day. Team Penske became the only motorsports organization to compete successfully in both NASCAR and IndyCar at this time. Throughout the 1990s, the IndyCar team continued its dominance. Rick Mears, Emerson Fittipaldi, Al Unser Jr., and Paul Tracy combined for 38 wins, three Indy 500 titles, and two series championships. Building a new engine, all under the cloak of secrecy, is rarely an achievable feat in the world of motorsports. Yet that is exactly what Team Penske and their partners at Ilmore Engineering were able to do for the 1994 Indianapolis 500. Utilizing an overlooked loophole, the Mercedes-Benz 500L pushrod power plant became the stuff of legend. Keeping the production of these parts and testing the new engine a secret became a project that James Bond would be proud of. We'll be running this car next week and the week after and probably running it during the month of May to try to get the durability we're going to need to finish this race. Now, it's one thing to say you've got a new formula and a new engine, but we have to finish the race. Team Penske used the Ilmore power to dominate much of the month of May. With 25 laps remaining in the race, Fittipaldi and Unzer Jr. were the only cars on the lead lap paving the way for little Al to win his second Indy 500. The talented trio still managed to win 12 of the 16 races on the 1994 PPG IndyCar World Series schedule. In 2006, Team Penske became the first LMP2 team to win a race overall when they finished 1-2 at the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. In 2008, they led Porsche back to victory lane in the 12 hours of Sebring. This marked Porsche's first win in the race since 1988, and the first time in 14 years that a non-premier class took the overall win. Elio Castroneves took the IndyCar series by storm in 2001 by winning the Indianapolis 500 on his first try. A year later, he became the first driver to win back-to-back -back 500s in his first two attempts. When Gilles DeFerron won the 2003 and Sam Hornish Jr. won the Team Penske's 14th 500 in 2006, the team was riding high when it came to Indianapolis. Castro Nevis scored another win in the Indy 500 in 2009. Open the door to the three-time winner's club. There's a brand new member and his name is Elio Castro Nevis. Daytona has been something that eluded us for so many years. The 2008 Daytona 500 was to be special. It was the 50th running of Stark Car Race's biggest event. Even the Harley J. Earl Trophy was plated in 24 karat gold for the occasion, setting the stage for one of the biggest wins in team history. With an assist from teammate Kurt Busch, Ryan Newman took the checkered flag to give Team Penske a 1-2 finish in a race that everyone wanted to win. Talk about conquering a race in style. 
The one piece of hardware that eluded Roger Penske was a NASCAR Sprint Cup Series trophy. Few believe that in just three full seasons of competition, a brash young driver would deliver the one thing needed to complete the mantle. Brad Keselowski came to Team Penske at the end of the 2009 season with loads of potential. Keselowski and crew chief Paul Wolf immediately showed why they were such a force in winning the 2010 NASCAR Xfinity Series title as they won their first cup race together in their 13th start. Expectations were higher in 2012, and the duo did not disappoint. Scoring five wins on the year, Keselowski stared down Jimmy Johnson, a five-time series champion at the time, all the way through the season finale at Homestead Miami Speedway to give Roger Penske the NASCAR Cup Series Championship that he had desired for so long. Following Will Power's Verizon IndyCar Series Championship in 2014, Team Penske headed into the 2015 season with seemingly every box checked on an amazing five-decade run. 15 Indianapolis 500 wins and a Daytona 500 trophy were sufficient in placing the Team Penske name among the most diverse race teams in the world. Wouldn't it be amazing to win both of those legendary races in the same year? That is exactly what happened in 2015 as Joey Logano won his first Daytona 500 and Juan Pablo Montoya picked up his second Indy 500 win. In addition, Team Penske began its first full season in the Australian V8 Supercars Championship, giving the team an opportunity to shine in another of the world's biggest races, the Bathurst 1000. 50 years, more than 80 drivers, over 420 wins, over 480 pole positions, numerous national championships, and most important, a respected name all over the world. That is the Penske way. It's an amazing story, isn't it? And given the importance of this year, when Roger Penske was visiting in Perth, I sat down with him to discuss his amazing journey in business and in racing. I want to wind the clock all the way back 50 years because this year we celebrate 50 years of Penske racing and for an Australian audience there's probably to a degree a misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge that you were a race driver with quite some success back in the day. Well, you know, I, I guess as every young guy grew up my dad took me to Indianapolis in 1951 and uh, I never realized that that was going to be something I wanted to do to be a driver, ultimately being a team owner. So uh, I had success but uh, in the, in the middle of the 60s, I had to make a decision, do I become a businessman and a Chevrolet dealer, in fact, in Philadelphia, or do I go on the racing side? And I think I made the right decision at that particular time. There you are, a Chevy dealer in Philly, uh, starting out from humble beginnings and you create this empire. Curious to understand what it is, what the key ingredients are, what is it that you brought to the table where you've grown this organization that so many others have not been able to do? Well, I, I think it's, uh, you know, commitment to your job uh, and not worrying about yourself, but what's best for the company. Uh, low turnover of your people. And, and to me, we have a very flat organization. You know, you learn that in racing. The, you know, the bloke that's driving the truck or cleaning the wheels is just as important as the driver. And you got to realize that. And I think that we acknowledge all of our all of our people. And I've tried to build a team that's loyal, that's transparent, and has integrity. And I think that's been our, you know, kind of our mission. And, and we were able to take that in partners have been very important to us. The racing has given us partnerships with all of the major manufacturers, which has helped build our auto business. And you've got a business now that has 53,000 employees, staff members, partners, whatever you'd like to call them. You sell more than 400,000 motor vehicles a year, and I put that in context. In the Australian passenger and light commercial vehicle market, we only sell a million vehicles. You're selling more than 400,000. You're well on your way to 500 major race victories 500 major race pole positions, 28 national championships, 16 Indy 500s. This is an astonishing portfolio, Roger. Well, 
you know, when you add it up like that, I listen to it, it sounds pretty good. It's My good. problem is I'm worried about the race tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. today, and the next one. And I think that, uh, you know, it's great to have that uh, success. And we've used it as a foundation. You know, we build off that because, mm -hmm. you know, we can, when we go in to talk to potential sponsors or we're doing a business deal, we can say, oh, this is the company you're going to deal with. Here's a success. You can talk to our partners and the people we've done business with. And it's really paid off. The, the notoriety that you get if you win the Indianapolis 500, what it's done, it's built the Penske brand, certainly in the U.S. So it's true to say that, in fact, racing is the cornerstone from a marketing and communication standpoint, and it's set the tone for the company, hasn't it, in many respects? You've used it as a tool. Well, I, I, I think I say it's a common thread through the company because, you know, it shows a competitive edge. You know, it shows execution. It certainly shows teamwork and, and quality. And, you know, we try to say integrity in, in racing. Sometimes people wonder when you say that <laughs> a lot goes on, as yeah. you know. But uh, it's, been a, it's really been the cornerstone of our business and, and we use it every day. I mean, people uh, want to come to work for us and we get hundreds of letters a year of young people who, whether they're engineers or technicians or just people want to come and join our company and it's amazing. We've built this organization from within. I would say 95% of our key people started at some lower level in the company and that's why we have such good talent. More than 80 senior drivers have been with you in the journey. Some of those relationships go in various directions, but you brought everybody back together early in the year to celebrate 50 years of Penske Racing. I think there was literally only a couple of people that were missing from that celebration. And man, is it an all-star lineup. You've got the Unsers, you've got Danny Sullivan, you've got Rusty Wallace, you've got Montoya Power. I mean, this, it is a who's who. You know, all these drivers are uh, tremendous. And uh, someone asked me, well, who's your favorite driver? You know, I really don't have a favorite right. driver because you know, we don't, we don't have our drivers buy a ride. We don't have a number one driver, a number two driver. When you're on our race team, we want to provide you the very best. And I think you'll, if you ask Scott here today and you ask Fabian Coulthard, I think they understand that. What I'm trying to do is have a level playing field for our guys. And uh, the success we've had is because, you know, they become part of the family. I mean, you do anything for them and hopefully the, the feelings are the same way back to us. And occasionally we've had some bumps in the road and people moved on. But that's a very, very mm. few times, uh, you know, during our time frame. I wonder what it was like for you to win that first Indy with Mark Donahue way back in, I think it was 1972. 72. Yeah. yeah, that would have been huge. Well, you know, we, we had a plan with our sponsor. We said we'd do it in three years. It took us four, so we were a little off our <laughs> plan. But it was, uh, it was quite a... You know, quite a day for us to yeah. to be able to go into Winter Circle and after going to that track and seeing what it the history and you know we used to go there and at the beginning of May and run for almost 25 days before the race. Yeah. Now of course they've shortened it, but what what probably you know sticks in my you know, racing veins is is not the wins, it's the disappointments. And uh, I think that as I as I look back. Probably, you know, one of the key ones in 1994, uh, we led every lap but two in the race. We sat on the pole uh, and ended up, Al Unser Jr. won the race with the Mercedes engine. And we came back in 1995 and we didn't mm -hmm. qualify for the race. And I remember, uh, you know, walking down the pit lane, 100,000 people on uh, qualification day. We didn't make the race with the two drivers. And, yeah. You know, that really, uh, uh, really made a difference. I think, uh, you know, we then had the split with Indy, but we came back in 2001 and won it three times in a row. So it made us better as individuals and it made us better collectively, which uh, to me is uh, something I won't forget. And then the second one would be when Kenseth knocked Kozlowski out of the, at Martinsville last year. So those are the things that are right <laughs> up here that I won't forget. I can remember the industry being literally astonished by your cars not qualifying at that Indy uh, and that event at Martinsville last year that you spoke about as well. But it was it was hard to fathom that that could be an outcome for a team that had delivered so much prior to that. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I had a chance to uh, play around a round of golf with uh, Jordan Spieth uh, before the uh, Masters, and uh, I'd known him from before, and uh, I, I sent him a letter. Uh, you know, following, uh, you know, he led the first day, the second day, the third day, and of course on uh, the last day and the last night he, you know, came apart and I sent him a note and said, I, I, you know, you're a great guy and I'm wonderful playing with you, but I have a similar circumstance and I related to him, you know, walking down the pit lane after leading everything the year before and going home, I said, you'll be a stronger guy. So yeah. it's, 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 I think, part of your DNA and, uh, you know, the 
you, you lose more than you win in racing. And I think that's what's great about across this whole garage area. You know, these guys come back. You know, you come back. You always think you can do better. And, 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 and that's why the people in it are so good. Roger, it's an absolute pleasure to spend a moment with you. I know you're a very busy man. The fact that we can have an expanded conversation about broader things in motorsport beyond supercars is a privilege for me. So thank you well, very great. much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Mean it.